What's up, gifted family? Welcome to another episode of the show that is the GP YouTube. Just a reminder that if you support what we do here, make sure to go over to giftedperformance.com and sign up for our automated coaching service. For only a dollar a day, you'll get access to 15 highly customized training programs, a macronutrient calculator, our meal planning feature that lets you build and save meals based on your macros, as well as access to our private Facebook group. All subscriptions help us in continuing to put out great content to get you to your fitness goals. Thanks for stopping by, and without any further delay, let's get into today's video. Enjoy. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the GPP, the Gifted Performance Podcast, where we give you the information and practical takeaways to improve your own general physical preparedness. I am a lucky, lucky man today, talking bodybuilding with an OG in the game, Mr. Peak himself, as some people know him. But guess what? No peak goes well unless you're shredded to begin with. So that's the real thing that we want to highlight about Mr. Cliff Wilson today. That he gets the people very shredded, knows what he's talking about. Very educated, very accomplished. Cliff, how are you? I'm good. I appreciate you guys having me on. I I, <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I, I also appreciate that you're wanting to talk about some things in addition to peaking. <laughs> yeah, guys, later, a PSA out to the world. Cliff does more than just peak people. Most of the viewership just tuned out. They were like, all right, well, if he's not talking about peaking, I don't even want to hear anything from him. I got my two other GP co-hosts with me today. Cam. You're on the top of my screen, so I'm going with you first, Paul. I'm, I'm not. I'm not slighting you. I'm sorry. Uh, what's going on, Paul? How's the new Keurig treating you? Did it's you even not get it open? Operational yet, man. <laughs> I'm gonna have to do this without without some coffee. All right. Well, we we still think you can pull it through. All right. Well, let's get things going. We got a lot of questions to go through today. A lot of really top tier content, hashtag content that we are bringing to the people around the topic of getting shredded for competition. Uh, first and foremost, I'm sure you may have heard it from Cliff before. It is the Cliff Wilson intro. Cliff, you want to throw the people a quick brief one about you, your competitive history, athletic history, coaching business, when you got started, all that? Yeah, yeah. Um, I have been coaching now for 10, almost 11 years. Jeez, time time flies. It's never, it's never fun watching the transition, as they call you, the the younger coach in the game. And then everyone calls you, sir, over the court, you know, they're watching that transition through the emails. But, um, so yeah, I've been coaching 10 years now, full time, uh, for eight and, um, just work with bodybuilders. I don't even work with general population. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, my own competitive history. Um, I've been competing myself since 2008. Um, I won my natural pro card in 2016 and then I did my first pro show, uh, um, two years ago. Um, and you know, I coached both enhanced and natural competitors. Um, but, uh, because I'm natural, I think people tend to know me more as a, a natural coach, but you know, I, I think that's just kind of, um, the, the side that's calling on to me more, but anyway, um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much living the dream, just working with bodybuilders full time, not doing anything else, just talking meathead stuff with everybody. My 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 um, educational background is that um, I'm entirely self-educated. Um, it took me a little while to even know if I should be coaching people. Um, I really was just studying uh, for my own competitive purposes. And um, I started helping a few people out and as each person started doing well and better than the last. And then I, uh, I finally was like, okay, I think I need to start charging for this. And before I knew it, it turned into a job. And so, uh, I always just put my information out there and I tell people, you know, uh, you don't have to take it as gospel, just, uh, you know, assess it for what it is, even though I don't have the, um, educational credentials. Was there any moment that you kind of look back on and, and you say, all right, like this was the moment when I realized like I, I can do this, like despite the fact that I don't have the formal education, like I'm legit. This is this is what I can do full time. You know, um, it was actually at the first show I ever put a client in. Um, <clears throat> it, it, I was just I was coaching and it wasn't even a client. I was coaching two guys for free 
at my gym. And, um, <clears throat> you know, a lot of people know, uh, Lane was already doing, Lane Norton was already doing this full time <clears throat> and I was just having fun. And, um, my guy went against his in the overall and, um, my guy was really lean and, you know, uh, this was like, yeah, this was like back in 2010 or something. And Lane, Lane was really nice. He came up that to me and he just said, man, he goes, not a lot of people get guys as lean as you just did. And he goes, you could have, a, he goes, you can make a lot of money doing this someday. And I was like, maybe this could be a job. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Um, so I, 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 after that, I was like, all right, let me get, let me try to try to make this a career. And I went for it after that. So did, did your guy beat Lane's guy? He did. He did. Oh, take that, <laughs> Lane. Right but, in the face. but Lane, but Lane's gotten me plenty of times over the years too. So I'm not going <laughs> to pretend, pretend like, uh, I came away unscathed over the years. Sweet. Um, in your bodybuilding career, have you always been self-coached or have you had other people that have coached you? Who do you have as kind of your coaching influences? I, I was uh, I, I've been entirely self-coached. And it's funny because I didn't before I got into this, I wasn't even aware that there was like an online community. I was like a hermit in my own world. I was mostly a, a book reader, not really reading online. Um, and so um I only found out who Lane was like a couple months before that show, honestly. Um, and so I, I would say that um, most of my influences over how I approach things in my coaching career don't come from the bodybuilding world or even the fitness world. I always kind of call myself like a, a scavenger of principles. <laughs> um, I, I mean, uh, I got some good principles from I played um, basketball in high school and college. I got some good coaching principles from them. Um, even some strange places like, uh, I think Greg Popovich from the Spurs has like, um, some good coaching principles. Um, I, so he's known for going crazy later on in life, but Howard Hughes, you know, the aviator and director of movies yep. from like way back in the day. Um, he wasn't, you know, formally educated in like engineering and aviation. Um, but he pioneered a lot of new aviation technology um, primarily through like curiosity and tinkering. And so, um, I would say being not formally educated, I can appreciate, um, I'm not, I, I never consider myself like the smartest guy in the world, but I, I'm very curious. So I never hesitate to tinker and then take what works, discard what doesn't, and then continue that process to get better. So, um, I could keep going on with people, but just kind of, I, I think I, I generally observe other people, and then either in the bodybuilding world or not. And then I take the principles that work and I kind of make it part of my own thing. Yeah. Cam, are you, are you seeing, I'm see, seeing some shades of your, of your own history here, your coaching trajectory. Uh, yeah. hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. Cam's basically like your retarded little brother. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> So Cam, that actually kind of sounds like you are describing Cam with he doesn't have, you know, the formal education and drives us insane with all of his tinkering of, hey, let's move this variable around. Let's do this. What happens when we do this? And I just want to shake him sometimes. But honestly, that's that's how he's learned a lot. And it sounds like you did a lot of the same things. Yeah. You know, um, one of my favorite books is um, is a is a book called Anti-Fragile. And it's it's um, it's not a bodybuilding book at all. It's a it's a book, a lot of economics in there, but also like the nature of things in general. And the gist of it is that um, certain things will get stronger with stressors um, or even damage because um, it's all information. So if you even if you if something doesn't work, it steers you closer to what does. And so um, I think that oftentimes that is extremely useful in bodybuilding. You change one variable at a time, it works or it doesn't, but then it sends you in the right direction. So I'm, I'm right with you, Cam. <laughs> I think that's just how men operate just in general. Like you got to fuck up before you like learn anything, you know, <laughs> it's a great way to learn. <laughs> yeah. No, and and I, I actually think that's a big problem in bodybuilding where like people are afraid to fuck up. You know, they're like, they, they mess up or they have a bad placing or they, you know, try something that doesn't work. And it's like they're just overtaken with shame. <laughs> you know, and It's like, you know, I, I mean, I've never had a problem just being like, oh, well, that didn't work. Let's just move on, you know. Um, and, but for some reason in bodybuilding and, you know, you see it all the time with these coaches. They don't they don't ever want to admit like 
when something didn't work to their client. Um, you know, if, if I, if I've tried something with a client and I would just, you know, it didn't work out or something, I'll just tell them like, Hey, I don't think it's working. Let's shift, you know, shift gears. But if you want to die on the hill, that is your ego. That's fine. <laughs> All right. So let's get into some actual bodybuilding questions here. All right. So the first one that I had for you, Cliff was, it's a question about kind of getting into what we consider true stage condition. So the question is, what do you think is the biggest like delineating factor between competitors who really genuinely get shredded and those that just don't quite make it? They get on stage and you're like, man, I wish that they had like another two or three weeks. Then they really would have nailed it. Um, you know, I think that there's probably two factors. Um, the first one is sort of the, the gates to get into that door, you know, to get into that room, to be able to make it is that, um, I think a lot of people poorly plan. Um, I, I, I haven't done it in a few years, but I went through my, I went through my applications one year and I tried to see how many people that applied to work with me had picked a show that I felt was, um, appropriate, allowed appropriate prep length to occur. Um, and, um, 94% of them needed to choose a later show, in my opinion. Um, so, you know, the thing that I always say is that, like, you can make the correct diet changes all the way through to create um, the appropriate amount of fat loss that you're aiming. But if you need to lose six, seven more pounds than what you realize, then all of your perfect changes mean nothing because you, cho you chose a show that was too soon. Um, so I would say that's like, that's like the first, um, barrier to entry that I see is people don't give themselves enough time to diet. And it's usually for various things. They don't want to diet too long. They think they have less fat to lose than what they actually do, which is a big one. Um, so I would say the first barrier to entry is that the second one is then, um, if they bypass that is then following the plan. Um, and, and it doesn't often look like what people think it looks like. It's not always, uh, oh, I cheated on my diet. I'm embarrassed. It's actually like convincing yourself that an alternate route is better in the moment. Uh, I, I mean, and we've all been there, but like you look at yourself and you're like, oh, I'm too flat. I need this refeed day. Um, or, you know, I'm losing too fast. I really need to slow things down. Um, when in reality, it's like, according to your rate of loss, you're right on track to where your goal should be. So I think it's a matter of remaining disciplined to the plan that you set in place to follow through and not let these day to day fluctuations in your look or your weight or your feeling steer you off course. So I would say those are the two biggest things aside from any, any dietary or training changes. So when you coach yourself and you're kind of in that moment of like, man, you know, maybe I need an extra refeed here. Maybe my weight is dropping a little bit too much this week. What's the internal dialogue that you have since you don't have a coach to go to? How do you stay objective with yourself? Um, all right. You're going to think I'm crazy with this, but um, I, so do. I take photos of myself um, and then I email myself to my client <laughs> email, and I put my weight in there. And I step away from my computer for a few hours um, and I wait till I haven't looked at myself in a little while. And um, I analyze my photos and my weight and I may put a few notes in there for the week, but I analyze what I've just written to myself as if I'm viewing a third party person. Like I try not to I try to ignore any feeling I may have and I go by what is in front of me the way I do with my clients. I go by. Um, I go by the weight that I'm seeing, the adjustment in the pictures that I'm seeing and the few notes that I've jotted down and, um, any feeling that I have about me is separated through what I have in text in photos in front of me. Um, hopefully I just didn't kill my business there. <laughs> by having everybody shot with another head on his body. No, nah, I think a lot of people appreciate that. It's a very uh, unique answer, something I wasn't expecting, but it makes a lot of sense if you're able to like stay true to that process. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm like, uh, my girlfriend thinks I'm crazy. I'm like, got another check in from Cliff today. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, so there's a big push and there's a little bit of a sidebar, but there's a big push right now, I think, with like video calls and, you know, having access to to video and thing. 
Um, a lot of coaches really want to have these video conferences with their clients. And a lot of times I kind of tell my clients, I would prefer not to have the video calls and make the changes because having that little bit of layer of um, objectivity, like if I get too close and if we have a video call for 30 minutes and they're telling me about, hey, I feel, you know, really tired or, you know, I can see how they're really worn down, um, you know, human empathy kicks in and you're not going to probably be as tough on them as you need to be. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen, but like some of the great coaches that I've known have tried prepping their wives um, and it doesn't usually end up great. You know, they don't get to the same level that their other clients do because they they end up care. You know, they care about that person. So I think that um, sometimes being able to see, you know, that they're struggling a little bit actually makes you pull your punches a little bit as a coach. So I, I a lot of times tell people I prefer email uh, for that reason. That's really interesting. I can definitely see where you're coming from 100%. I feel like, though, I've also had scenarios where and maybe it's not through video because sometimes, too, that it just becomes unrealistic when you have so many clients to be like, all right, where everybody's getting a video chat. You know what I mean? But um, like where through text or maybe it is video or FaceTime or call or something like I pick up on certain things and I'm like, OK, uh, and sometimes because Cam and I co-coach a lot of people as well, I'm like, I, I sort of get the hint that something is coming around the corner, whether it's like a binge or they're going to break or you know what I mean? And I feel like sometimes it ends up working out to where you you sort of save that and like, OK, we're going to give you a little more food. Like it's clear you're like hurting and maybe in the long term it ends up being better. Like I think, you know, it could end up going both ways. I agree with that. So actually in my check-in process through email, I don't require a lot of information. Um, I usually just say your photos, your weight, and then tell me about your week. Um, so like, I don't have like a big data spreadsheet that I have people fill out or anything like that. Um, I'm like, I want them talking, you know, we'll do it through email, but it gives me a little more time. And this is a, actually more of a me thing <laughs> on this end is that I actually tend to do better when I can see or hear information and then have a few moments to kind of process it before I act upon it. But um, so it's actually probably the same same concept where, like I said, through video chat or through email, I think getting people talking is a very useful tool because um, as they talk, you're going to find out things about them, what's important to them, what they're struggling with. So I agree with you 100 percent about that. So as coming from an athlete's perspective, aside from setting aside more time to obviously prep for the show this so you have more weeks what are what are some some workarounds some some ways to get over these barriers to get truly shredded is it just like hey listen it's just no it's just buckle down psychological strength here be mentally tough and let's get through this or are there some other strategies that you encourage your clients to use journaling the talking about it whatever whatever it may be yeah i mean for for a first time competitor I, I don't want to say that they're screwed, but um, <laughs> it's um, hard to know what you don't know if you're a first or even maybe second time competitor. You know, like, I, I mean, it's it's almost impossible for a first time competitor. I, I mean, for an experienced coach, you guys know it's hard. It's hard when you have somebody that's never really dieted down before. Picking their show weight is difficult, even for an experienced coach. So for a first time competitor, it's it's damn near impossible. Um, so in that case, I would actually recommend dieting down to a semi lean weight first to like gauge. I, I would say one of the workarounds is not, not choosing a show beforehand. Um, just diet with the, and this even this, I, I like this for experienced competitors too, but, um, diet with the goal of reaching your best physique. And once you know, you're maybe three, four weeks out from that, then find a show and jump in. Um, because it removes the, um, because I think oftentimes choosing a show really far in advance, the goal becomes the date. Um, but I would rather have the goal be your best look. Yep. Um, and there's so many bodybuilding shows now. Like, I mean, if you don't mind a little bit of travel, you can just, you know, you can dive in anywhere. Um, maybe not with COVID, but, <laughs> but, but, uh, so I would say that's probably the best workaround is diet in order to get lean. But I think a lot of people, um, have difficulty staying on track with that. Um, but ultimately I think 
being able to focus more on the process than the result is going to be the thing that will help get them there. Um, and I, I would say like one one kind of mantra I give to a lot of my clients is, uh, you know, stop looking at your show date. Stop, you know, if, if you really are sure you want to do this, stop looking at the date. Stop thinking about the show. I want you thinking about your your next training session, your next meal, your next good night of sleep. Um, I only want you looking at the next thing that will make you better. Thinking about your show is not going to make you better. I love yeah. it. I hope every future client we ever get watches this. And I, I, everything you just dropped is like the a coach's unicorn that we just hope to see in our next application. Hey, I just want to compete. You know, let, let's just start dieting whenever we we feel like we're a hop and a skip away. We'll pick a date. Um, and then they're not texting you and like, look like Googling the show to see who's competing with them and like all that crazy stuff. Yeah. You know, just, doing, I, just worried about today and tomorrow. Like, <laughs> yeah. Paying attention to variables you can't control is so counterproductive. Um, and <clears throat> you know, I, I think there's also something that like bodybuilders are, are super guilty of this too, where they're like, uh, they're, you're told to, um, imagine, you know, uh, positive imagery, you know what I mean? There's imagery. You're supposed to imagine like yourself on stage collecting the first place trophy. And, um, you know, that, that will help, you know, push you along. Um, research in psychology shows that the, 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 um, visual imagery of, you know, positive outcomes, uh, actually leads to worse performance. Um, with, I mean, that's clearly been proven in psychological, uh, studies is that, um, when you're sitting there and, and, and the, the studies have shown that the main reason is exhaustion. Um, you know, if you imagine yourself on stage collecting your first place trophy and stuff like that, um, you can create like an emotional response in yourself because it feels good. And, um, also, you know, those positive emotional responses usually have a, um, a come down and it's exhausting. So it's like, um, try to remain as steady as possible and focus on that very, that very next thing that will actually make you better. Yeah, I think that's I think that's kind of rerouting it to be very process oriented, which is what we try and coach a lot of our clients on. Be process oriented. Check your boxes today. The outcome's going to be there for you. It'll yeah. it, trust me, that first place trophy, it'll be waiting for you, but only if you handle the process of checking your boxes today. It's it's not very sexy. People don't want to hear that. <laughs> not at all. It, and it makes me think about like certain scenarios, too, that I know we've had this past year where like. A client will be talking about wrecking nationals, getting their pro card, and they haven't even qualified yet. But they haven't even competed that, yet. We're, we're months away from qualifying, and we just had these like four massive struggles over the past three weeks that we've been trying to overcome. Like, I always call that the WWE approach. Like, <laughs> like everyone in nationals better watch out. I'm coming in, brother. <laughs> Not to hurt some feelings. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, uh, people forget and I literally just made a post about it yesterday, but um, people always think that somehow their their wanting of a first place is somehow enough to be deser deserving of a first place. Um, but the only way you deserve is through your actions. And, you know, if you can't translate that want into positive and effective action, then you're you're fooling yourself. It, it's a fantasy at that point. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Hey. So the next part of this question is more over on the coaching side of things as opposed to the athlete side of things. When when you get a client that, you know, you look at their check in, maybe they're two or three weeks out, they're already on low calories, they're already on, you know, are very, very high cardio, low calories. And you're like, all right, this person still, you know, has a solid three to four pounds to lose. They're three to four weeks out. The next cut is going to have to be a serious one. This one makes me a little bit nervous. Mm -hmm. How do you kind of rationalize that? How do you go about that mentally when you make that cut? Cause I get small women that I coach and it's like, Holy shit, our next calorie <laughs> cut has you eating 900 calories. I'm, I'm concerned for you. So how do you kind of get over that? Um, no, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Like if you get a hundred pound bikini competitor, you're like, man, we're really going for it here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So I, I think the first thing that I do is talk to them. Um, I'm a I'm a I'm a big believer in communication. 
because um, I think if it comes to this point where you're just this guy that's prescribing things and they're expected to follow, um, it, you know, I like to say, like, this is what needs to be done. Um, and I will say, do you think you are up to this? Um, so I want their feedback and I want them to um, also take ownership of our plan. And I do that all the way through the process, but you know what I mean? I want them to be, I want them to be able to say, yes, I can. Or, you know, if they have objections to it, speak up. Um, and then I'll also just make it clear to them that if you start to struggle or you start to feel like you're going to binge or you're too tired or you just, um, I say, talk to me about it and we will find, you know, find an alternate solution or a workaround. So, um, I talk to them first. And then I say, this is what I think needs to be done. Are you on board with this? And usually they're like, yeah. I mean, bodybuilders are, 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 you know, they don't want to, they don't want to be seen as weak, but a lot of times they're like, okay, we can do this, but there's a lot more. Um, and, and in my experience, there's a lot more um, willingness to take on the challenge. If the challenge has been presented to them rather than forced upon them, if that makes sense. Yeah, you're making them part of the process as opposed to coercing them into it. Here's what you have to do. Here's what I am demanding that you do. And you're flipping that. I like that. Psychologically, that makes sense. Do you have any like, do you read like a lot of psychology books? Are you really into like a lot of the psychology research? I, I am. Uh, okay. You know, you, you know, uh, it, it's kind of funny. I'm actually working on a new book that is like purely psychological based. Um, I, I, I'm so when I first started coaching, um, at the time, some of the things that I was doing were significantly different than I think a lot of other people were doing. And, um, and I knew that it worked cause I had done it with a few people and I knew that, um, a, but then the problem was I found that a significant number of people could not see it through to the end. Um, whether it be, um, confidence issues or motivation issues or, um, discipline issues, whatever it may be. Um, they didn't seem to have the mental tools to finish the the training and nutrition plans that I was putting in place. So, um, and, uh, I, I was, I'm kind of not, I, I had been notoriously bad at understanding people. And so, um, I was like, I need to learn how people think. And so, um, I probably, you know, I probably do like a 33.3%, uh, of my time devoted to training research, 33.3 to nutrition and 33.3 to psychology. Um, and I would say I started to get a much better handle personally on the psychological research probably around 2013, 2014, which is when my business really started to take off. And I was like, I can really build, I don't need these incredibly mentally tough athletes to join with me. I can kind of build them from the ground up, if that makes sense. Uh, and so, um, yeah, I, I think it's more useful than people realize because um, I think what people think looks like mental toughness or strength is oftentimes kind of a masking, you know, these guys that are like, I'm just going to put my head down and not look at anything. I'm going to grind through. And yeah. you guys have seen, those are the guys that being the hardest when they go off and, you know, they can't get on track. And, and so, um, yeah, I'm a big believer in kind of, you can't, you can't execute the physical without the mental behind it, driving it. I'd imagine getting into that aspect to you not only helps you sort of like mold your clients, but it's probably helped you mold yourself a little bit to different like types of individuals as well. Instead of just having, hey, I can only work with this one person, this person that just does. <laughs> yeah, you, and, and you're absolutely right. Um, I, I mean, perfect example. I'm not an anxious guy. Um I've never struggled, you know, I'm fortunate I've never struggled with anxiety or anything like that. But um, it took me time to understand how people's anxieties play out during prep, anxiety of what if I don't look good, what if I don't place well, will I be ready, things like that. And so um, reading a lot of research on, you know, anxiety, generalized anxiety, things like that, how to mitigate them made me a lot better in terms of how to work with other people. Um, and And I think that there are a lot of like, characteristics uh so the, the new book i'm working on is it's all about um the characteristics that lead to someone being mentally tough and um 
you'll find that each person has like strengths and weaknesses within these characteristics, whether it be motivation or confidence or discipline or resiliency. And some people are better at one or not the other. And so it's like, it kind of becomes like a puzzle where you're, you're like, okay, this person's clearly lacking in confidence. How do we work on building that up along the same time where I'm like, let's follow this diet and let's follow this training. <laughs> you know what I mean? So um, you kind of pick your points where, where the improvements need to happen the most. And for coaches that probably don't see the value or maybe they don't see the value yet in psychology, I would assume that your retention rate of clients has also gone significantly up since starting to specialize more or pay more attention to the psychological aspect. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't um, I don't work with a lot of clients. I mean, this may sound like a big number, but over or almost 11 years now, I've only worked with a little over 400 clients. Um, that's, you know, that I I. I usually keep people and and I think the biggest thing is I, so sometimes you get people that come to you and they're just mentally you guys know they're they're like mentally on point they're driven they know how to handle their stuff but they they need help with tweaking their diet and their training yep. um and in that case let's tweak the diet and training and then you have other people where it's like their diet and training programs seem to be locked in you know they're they're good with that they are genetically elite physically um, and, but they're like a mess mentally, you know, they're riddled with, um, confidence and motivation issues. So in that case, it's like, all right, I can pretty much set the training and the diet. Uh, you know, we're here, it's autopilot. Let's do a little more mental work with this person. So I think it's just a, it's kind of like a diagnosis process of what each client needs, um, to improve the most, to make them the most successful. Are there, are there any times where you're just like, Okay, I can't fix this. Like, I'm sorry, we, it, it's just not gonna happen. <laughs> yeah, um, I actually do. Um, so, I, I do uh, have um, someone that I refer people to um, for like online, you know, therapy um, that I, that is athlete minded. I I always say that um, I can help people with things, but I'm like, I draw the line. If I think we need to start talking about your childhood. Then so, so somebody else needs to take care of that. If, if, if we need to ask you about your childhood, I'm going to let somebody else ask about that. I'm probably, probably going to get that contact from you. <laughs> yeah, I, I will. I'll give it to you because I, you know, um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a therapist. I'm not a psychologist. I, I can help with the more surface. I can help with the the process of, of improving your thought process. Um, yeah. but I can't have, I'm not qualified to help people overcome like past trauma issues or anything like that, you know? So circling back to the athlete who, you know, maybe has a couple pounds left to lose. There are a couple weeks out. Are there any strategies? The question that I wrote down just has like physiological strategies, mm -hmm. but now I want to lump psychological strategies in there as well. Are there any physiological or psychological strategies that you use in those final few weeks when the going really gets rough? Um, physiological strategies is that um, I think it's always that fine line between OK, you want to push, but you don't want to. I mean, I think we've all seen it where um, now there's a difference between natural and enhanced athletes because enhanced athletes, you can push. Extremely, extremely hard, and not really have as much. Physical um, detriments take yeah. place. Um, so I think that if you're an enhanced athlete, there's a reminder that you can push extremely, extremely hard and you're not going to see like a deterioration of your of your physique. Natural athletes is a little more of a fine line to walk. Um, so I, I would say in general, um, a, I, I, I hate to sound so simplistic, but I mean, you're going to need a big caloric cut um, and a, a big increase of cardio. Hopefully, I think there's a good setting up process that needs to take place. If you've already cut food, you haven't given yourself enough time and you've already cut food really like as low as you can go in the weeks prior and cardio is already pretty high. There's not really anywhere you can go. So I think that you need to um, uh, make sure you leave yourself some room for that last few weeks push. But, um, you know, then I think it's a matter of if somebody hasn't been losing up to that point, look at some of the variables with their diet. Um, uh, people are really notorious for having calories sneak their way in. Uh, you know, are they are they chewing three packs of gum? Yeah. Are they chewing three packs of gum per day and eating five containers of Tic Tacs? Um, you know, uh, even little things like excessive use of cooking spray, 
Um, that I can't believe it's not butter spray. You know what I mean? It says no calories on it, but if you're putting, if you're eating, you know, consuming a hundred sprays per day, um, that's going to start adding up. All these things come together. Um, amino acid use is a big one. Uh, in the United States, they don't allow caloric, uh, calories to be listed on the labels of amino acids, but they have calories just like any other protein source. I mean, sometimes I'll have clients say, well, you know, I've been getting hungry, so I've been mixing in some branched chain amino acids in my water. And when I when I tell them to add up their branched chain amino acids, their essential amino acids, their glutamine, their arginine, I'm like, you're consuming like 80 additional grams of protein right here. Um, so, uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, you know, I'll cut. Sometimes uh, one tactic I'll do is I'll just say no amino acids. Um, you know, we're going pure diet um, from here. So um, I think that's a big one. And then um, step count. I, I I don't usually like to measure step counts, but in the final week, if you got to if you if you got to push, you've got to push. So I'll prescribe some cardio, but then I'll also prescribe a step count. Um, so I would say those are more from the physiological aspect. From the psychological aspect, um, I would say this is the only time if you're in the final few weeks where I'll use what I would call like a little more cheerleader type motivation. Um, you know, I think if you use that too soon. It wears, it wears yeah. thin, but Lose I think the final weeks you can do it. You know, some, th some things like saying, I know you can do this, you know, it's hard, um, you know, empathize with them that, you know, as a competitor myself, I know how difficult it is. So I find that telling them, you know, about any difficult experiences I had shows them that it, it can be done. And, you know, you guys compete too. I think that, um, I I'm not, I'm not this great competitor. Most of, I, I always say, probably 75 to 80 percent of my clients would kick my ass on stage <laughs> um, but I think that um, it helps when clients understand that you're not asking them to do anything you wouldn't do yourself or haven't done and so um, you know I think I think making it clear like this is what needs to be done from a psychological aspect then I would just say making it clear that this is what needs to be done um, all that's left is to do it and something that I think Paul might actually disagree with you on here is the end stage of a contest prep for an enhanced versus a natural athlete and like the, the possibility of rate of tissue loss. Paul, did you want to expand on that? Yeah, we, we can talk about that a little bit. I, I think that sometimes people overappreciate what steroids can or, you know, being enhanced can do. Um, and I feel like, you know, one thing that sort of speaks to this um, is a lot of enhanced guys will come out of shows and they do these rebounds and they'll, they'll, a lot of them get kind of chubby, but you know, some of them gain what seems to be like an appreciable amount of muscle post show. And, you know, when you start looking at the literature, there are like the, the biggest circumstances where we see that is when people are regaining lost tissue because we know that can happen incredibly rapidly from detraining or hard dieting or whatever, anything like that. So I think like a lot of times what we see when like enhanced guys come out and rebound is just regaining lost tissue um, because, uh, I mean, a lot of guys, you know, sort of like what you mentioned, sort of do preps that are a little too short for the amount of body fat they have to lose and end up having to grind really hard and do lots of cardio, get the calories really low or on the enhanced aspect, maybe go a little too hard into certain, uh, certain compounds, stuff like that. Uh, I, I actually agree with, that. I think it should probably quantify like what I mean with pushing harder is that, um, I would say for natural athletes in the final weeks, I don't want to see us losing any more than 1.5 pounds per week, usually. Um, but with enhanced athletes, I may bump that up to 2.25, maybe 2.5. Um, I'm not talking about like the, you know, the giant drops that I see from like, sometimes I see guys losing like four and five, <laughs> six pounds, you know, in the final weeks. So I, I guess I should um, qualify that a little bit with, uh, I, I definitely agree with you that I think that there's, um, the 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 PEDs don't allow for anything goes type behavior. Um, I, I would say that the ability to push a little bit harder 
Um, the ability to push a little bit harder without the negative repercussions just exists, but it's not like this unlimited power. So I, I, I agree with you on that because, um, I, I mean, you do see it. I mean, you see it a lot of times too with, uh, the enhanced guys where, um, on show day, uh, yeah, they look lean, but you're like three weeks ago, you looked almost as lean, but significantly fuller. Yeah. Um, so I, I agree with you that I just think it's, um, you know, it's very interesting because not always, but, um, working with enhanced athletes, I think that, um, the enhanced versus natural, like the gas pedal of people that gravitate towards the enhanced side versus the natural side is a little bit different. The enhanced side, people are usually not always, of course, but going to want to be more like, let's push this, you know, let's go. Everything's a little faster. And so, um, I think sometimes on the natural side, you need to speed those guys up a little bit. And sometimes on the, on the enhanced side, you need to slow those guys down a little bit. Um, so I would say it's kind of like bringing everyone towards the middle a little bit more. <laughs> it's gonna, that's what I was going to say. There seems to be this like disconnect where enhanced guys are like, yo, I bet I can be ready in eight weeks. And all the natural <laughs> guys are like, you know what? I think I'll take a nice, aggressive 48 week prep. <laughs> okay, wait, hold on. Wait, what did you say? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think that, no, you're absolutely right. And um, I, I think that it's just, at the start of every prep, um, I, I always try to keep in mind of who I'm working with. Um, sometimes when I have those people that are like, you know, I, if I know they have a strong gas pedal, um, I don't even like to use the word prep. Um, because if you start with the word prep, they're like, you know, we, you know, for even in even, natural guys can be like this too, but you know, we'll be like 25 weeks out and they're like, prep starts today. You know, can't talk to my family anymore. I'm in prep, um, you know, and I'm like, you're going to burn yourself out. So I'll sometimes say things like, let's trim up a little bit to get in a good, you know, a good position for prep. Um, whereas other guys that have like this slow gas pedal, I'm like, we need to like, Hey, let's start cutting down, you know, like, now is the time because it's poor. Another thing too is a lot of times guys always think I have plenty of time. And I'm like, guess what? At four weeks out, everybody's pushing. Like, how are you going to separate yourself then? You know, like, I, I don't think many people are pushing themselves at 15 weeks out. doesn't mean you need to kill yourself at 15 weeks out. But having a little push now is when you separate yourself from everyone else. Because at four weeks out, guess what? Everyone's pushing to the max. You're not going to be able to separate yourself from the pack at that point. Um, but yeah, no, it, it's, it is very interesting to see the gas pedals. Um, and, and I tend to be a little bit more of a middle of the road kind of guy with that. So sometimes when I'm working with the natural athletes, I'm like, I'm like, we can lose more than 0.3 per week here. Um, and then, you know, when I work with some enhanced guys, I'm like, all right, yeah, no, you can't do the eight week prep. And, um, I, I mean, you get guys trying to lose like 50 pounds in 10 weeks. And I'm like, this is crazy. <laughs> I've never really understood the slow rate of loss in the natural crowd either, because on the enhanced side, it makes sense. If you lose slow, there's a possibility that maybe if you're early on in your career, you can get some recomp and you can actually do some growing early on in prep as a natural athlete. That shit ain't happening. You just, you ain't going to get that. The the only thing I'll say with the natural side is, uh, I mean, and I guess, I guess these are relative terms we're using fast and slow. So I guess yeah. I should be specific. Like, um, I generally think a pound per week is good. I, I, I like that rate. Um, and, you know, there's a, a little bit of give or take on each side, um, depending on who you're dealing with. Obviously, like smaller females are going to lose maybe a little slower than that. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I think there is some muscle retention. So, like, I, you know, I've, I've read a few studies and I've just personally witnessed that, you know, once you start getting up to the for some people, once you start getting up close to the two pound per week mark, it's like they look a little squishy almost. Um, yes. But uh, no, you're right. I think that there's a diminishing returns with slow preps where it's like, um, all right, we need to move because you could have been you could have been training hard and growing a little bit. Oh, you know, not much as a natural athlete, but a little At bit. Least a bit. Of this prep, yeah. Um, and, and, and then you get people too, that do these slow preps and then they're like, I'm going to, I'm going to diet down every year or every other year. And I'm like, you're, you're dieting almost more than you're, you're actually eating and training and growing. Yeah. 
And I Cam, think- Cam, I think, actually had another question regarding Jarek. Regarding, so Cam just had someone compete at the Chicago Pro. And then how long did Jarek have before Texas? Nine weeks? Seven. Seven weeks. So shredded for a Chicago pro has to get him from shredded to battle of Texas. And he wanted to ask about like reverse dieting cam. I don't want to ask your question incorrectly. So, so go ahead. Yeah. So I was just curious, um, to about how you, you go about deciding when someone is ready to start reverse dieting. Um, and how conservative or aggressive do you start their approach and, I guess, know when to make changes moving forward. Um, so when it's um, in the reverse dieting, how, how much t- in the scenario, how much time until their next show? Is it like weeks away or years away or how? how? Uh, seven weeks. Seven weeks. And would you say they're lean enough already? Yeah. Okay. I mean, so in that case, the first thing I try to lay the groundwork on is um, when they're seven weeks is, I would say seven weeks between shows is a dangerous amount of time because it's long enough to where they're like, I've got some time to relax. (laughs) And so uh, the thing, the thing that I try to minimize is immediate post-show overeating Um, because, you know, they think I want to fill out, you know, this is the mindset. And it's like, Evolutionarily speaking, of course, there's a lot of things in place to drive our mind, our minds to drive us to eat um, when we're really lean. So <clears throat> I think um, in the v- immediate post-show period, one of the worst scenarios I see is people eat way too much for the next two days and they gain too much. And then you have to go almost immediately back into dieting. Um, so, I, you know, because in, in two days, how much muscle are you going to regrow you know, um, and, I, and so I would say that um, I try to make it clear to them, first off, go enjoy that night. The next day we'll do a refeed, a good refeed, you know, we just but we're not going to let calories run amok unchecked. Um, so I try to say, like, we can regrow, but it needs to be in a sustained and steady manner. So, I mean, if you're going to go with um, if you're going to go seven weeks beforehand, um, I would say first, make sure that you can set it up to where they're not going to binge, um, and overeat in that first process. But I would start off fairly high. If they're enhanced, you can do quite a bit more from what, what I've seen than if they're natural. Um, so I would, um, if they're already pretty lean, I would probably jump it up pretty high. Like even give them a couple refeed days in a row and see how their body weight reacts. Um, but I would kind of do like more of a wave approach where you'll actually start high. So if they're, if they're down here with their caloric intake for the show, you can jump them up high almost immediately, ride that for a little bit, dip it down to sharpen them back up a little bit, because there is kind of a different look sometimes when you're coming down versus going up and then you can come back up after you sharpened up, but a more subtle. So if post show you're here. You come down to here, calorically speaking, and then bring it back up to maybe here, if that makes sense. Um, So I I would kind of, you know, down and then up, but not quite as high up. Um, So it's interesting what all you said, because I I think when we set this up, he was just just had gotten out of the show. And now we're about four weeks later. And so what had happened was that first weekend after put on that weight, we just went back into just digging it for one week. And he was good. For the following week after we brought calories back up and then started to kind of lose it with the time or just mentally with how much time was still remaining. And uh, I believe his calories ended up getting above 14 times body weight and he started dropping weight and coming back down and his calories have been able to stay. I mean, he, he was digging into the Chicago show maybe around night. 1500 calories and he was 215 mm-hmm. and 1900 and i think now he's sitting around 3200 or something <laughs> near the same weight so it's just pretty neat yeah because i remember we had a conversation about that when he was starting to kind of lose it a bit and i'm like well one we could probably save this if you just give him a little more food you know and then two if you want to take advantage of 
some sort of rebound or growth with like this and uh, somebody who's enhanced, you're probably going to want their food at least somewhere around or near maintenance um, for some sort of time period. And then uh, what was it? Shit. I lost my train of thought already. Well, I mean, you know what though? You're, you're right though. Like um, the, the big, di- I, the big difference I noticed between natural and enhanced in this regard is that <clears throat> I think with the enhanced guys, um, in the refeeding process, you're better to aim a little too high um, because the repercussions of having to come back down a little bit are not as great. Whereas like if, if you if you get a natural athlete entirely shredded and then you aim too high in the refeed and they put on some fat and then you need to relose more fat that you've already lost, um, they flatten out like a pancake. Um, whereas like I think that when you're enhanced, you bring food up you can actually regrow a little bit. Um, whereas the natural guy, um, a lot of the research shows when they're super lean, I mean, God, don't mean to scare anybody that's not aware, but I mean, when you're natural and you're like show conditioning, research shows you're going to have the testosterone of like a 65, 70 year old man. You're not going to build muscle <laughs> right then. So it's like, really, you just want to fill out enough to kind of mitigate some of the physical stressors upon your body. Um, and so it's not even really a regrowth type thing. It's sort of just a maintenance and, uh, damage mitigation technique. Whereas enhanced athletes, you can actually regrow a little bit because, um, depending on what, what the person's taking, um, and how much, but you, you know, so I think you're better off aiming a little bit higher for the enhanced athletes. Um, and then maybe not quite as high for the, for the natural. I got my train of thought back. Uh, He's and back. It comes, yeah, it comes back to uh, what you said earlier when Cam said brought food up, weight went down, and you were talking about how like calories sneak their way in there. And we had a conversation with him last night where I was like, "You quit snacking, didn't you?" And he was like, <laughs> "Yeah, I did." Beef <laughs> and chicken and stuff like that. He ended up having a buddy local that just sponsored him cook all the foods plain i was like i don't care if it's a meal prep company take it out of the container weigh it itself <laughs> make sure it's gonna ends up dropping like five pounds like oh well we might end up giving you more food now <laughs> yeah you know and and that's the the toughest thing too is like getting clients to tell you exactly what's going on because you know and i try to tell them too if you're not telling me what's going on i'm making changes off of false information um you know, if uh, I, I one analogy I always use is that like if I'm if we're on a road trip and I'm navigating and, you know, I tell them to get off at whatever number exit and then I take a take a nap and I wake up and I'm like, did you take that exit? And they're like, oh, yeah, I definitely took that exit, <laughs> but they didn't take an exit. I don't know where the hell we are. Do you know what I mean? Like I can't navigate you anymore because you're lying to me about not taking the, about taking the exit. <laughs> So we t- we touched on what I like to call caloric castration. Some of those one of those side effects that comes with that super elite world championship level conditioning. So what are some of the other ugly, less than ideal side effects that you see it? And Cliff, I need you to clear it up. Who has it worse when it comes to end of contest side effects, men or women? Oh man, I, I think. All right. So, I mean, we'll start off with the, the side effects of contest prep. You know, um, the I mean, common things are you're cold all the time. You're starving all the time. You can't sleep. Um, there's a general rise in agitation and um, and your libido is, you know, in the tank. I mean, it, it makes sense, though, because, you know, if we're if we're starving, if we're starving, it makes sense, evolutionarily speaking, where your body's like, Hey, you know, you can't sleep right now. You need to go find food. Cause I mean, I think we've all experienced it where, where you're really lean. You're kind of just on edge. Um, you know, it's like, don't sleep, go find food. Don't have sex, go find food. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, and so, uh, you know, I, I will say, well, I'll come back. Um, I think that the libido hit hits both men and women quite a bit. I think that men, notice it more than women because um i think um a significant part of 
being a guy is our sex drives. <laughs> so um, I think that we tend to, we're more aware of it. You know, I mean, women, women have the ability to go longer than men without sex. So I think that, you know, when, when we don't, when we're not noticing, we're not feeling sexual or sexual drive anymore. It's like something seriously wrong here. Um, you know, um, as far as women, I think one thing that's worse with women is the increase in anxiety. Um, uh, <clears throat> stress seems to get higher in women than it does in men. Um, but, uh, in general, I would say men probably seem to have it a little worse, I think. Um, because I don't think that men handle some of it as well. Like men don't handle the drop in their sex drive as well. Um, even when it comes to like doing cardio, um, when it comes to doing cardio, you, I mean, you can give a girl 45 minutes of cardio per day and they're like, you know, I could do a little bit more if you want me to, you give them, you give a guy 30 minutes of cardio and they're going to whine like crazy. Um, so I, I think that, um, I think that men probably have it worse, but you know, one thing I will say is that there seems to be, um, you know, muscle memory is a proven, proven mechanism. Uh, now I have no evidence for this other than anecdotal, but it almost seems as if there's some sort of fat loss, uh, uh, fat loss memory. Um, because I find that people that diet repeatedly, they seem to be able to get back to the previous best conditioning they've reached with fewer side effects than what they had previously. I don't know if you guys have noticed that at all. It with uh, women and usually quad separation too. Yeah. yeah. One thing I, I'm so glad you steered the conversation in that direction. I almost thought we were going to disagree for a minute, but I feel like lately men turn into what you expect, how you expect women to act at the end of prep. And lately I feel like almost every guy that we've worked with uh, prep wise uh, I don't want to say every, but a lot of them, I, I hit this point where I'm like, dude, this is embarrassing. The the way you're acting right now, it's embarrassing. <laughs> I think it's a flip side of the coin. Men, solid in off season. Women, solid at the end of the contest prep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and, and, and women do generally, in my experience, women don't like the off season as much. Well, and you know, that probably also plays because guys are feeling small during contest prep, which they don't want to feel. Yeah. And women are feeling bigger in the off season, which they don't want to feel. So it tends towards um, a little bit more positive motivation results there. So I wonder how much I like the idea of the fat loss memory. I might steal that. I won't give you any credit for it, though. It's not mine. <laughs> completely mine now. Um, but I wonder how much of it is like true physiological fat loss memory or yeah. if they just get better at the habits of <laughs> diet, if they just get more skilled at dieting and they understand more of what's to come and what to expect so they can handle a little bit more of those kind of both physiological and psychological perturbations that come with the end of prep better. I, I would say that, um, I, I pulled my punch from saying it because I don't want to keep coming back to the site. I don't want to keep seeming like a one trick pony with the psychological stuff, but I would say that psychological absolutely plays a big factor in it. Um, because I think that expectation also plays a huge role in how we react to certain things. Like if you look at the research on resiliency, um, there is a significant I mean, it, also, it's well documented that the psychological impacts the physiological. Um, I've done hormone panels with some of my clients, and um, I can definitely correlate drops in testosterone in a contest prep with how relaxed or stressed someone seems um, on the same people as well. Um, but uh, I mean, and you can also see it. One of the one of the cooler studies I've ever read um, is that they gave. Um, <clears throat> They gave uh, human subjects uh, a distinctly flavored drink with immunosuppressants in it, and they did that for three days straight. And of course, you feel like crap when you, your immune system gets suppressed. Um, and then they let their immune system recover, and they brought them in later and gave them the um, drink without the immunosuppressants, and their immune system dropped. 
Um, and so it's like expectation, you know, um, can play a big factor. And so I think that sometimes people that will tell themselves that they must do these certain things or they, they, they're going to feel like crap and it becomes the snowball effect. But I think that other times people that are a little more analytical in their approach, you know, I, I, when you diet down, you're like, well, I could have done this better this time. I can make this better. Um, and so I think that that can be a big factor of um, knowing what to expect, knowing what's normal, and then finding the ways to be able to mitigate the the negative side effects that you see and um, not stressing about it. Because, I mean, stress is a testosterone killer in itself. Um, I mean, you guys remember your first contest prep? Do you remember, like, the realizations of, like, whoa, I'm way more, I'm in way, a lot more suffering than I anticipated. I didn't know my sleep was going to be so bad or that I was going to be shivering all the time. And you know what I mean? Like, that was uh, just Paul. Huh? That's, that was just you, Paul. Yeah, I just did my first one. Honestly, it was less, here's the thing, my, my perception of contest prep, like, and don't get me wrong, I could have been leaner, could have pushed harder, you know, um, all of that. But like, to me, the act of prep was not, man, this is going to sound bad. Not that bad, but it's keeping everything else together while you're doing it. Like being hungry and like tired, if all you had to do was lay on the couch and do nothing all day, that would be cool. <laughs> but like keeping up with all your clients, making sure programs are going out on time, responding to, you know, just staying on top of life. And then the personal stuff too, like, I think that's what makes prep hard and stressful. Yeah. I, I, I don't think that there's a, you, you are absolutely right. Um, because, and then, and then I think sometimes people may get harder on themselves because they, um, I call this more of like an advanced prep technique in terms of discipline. Um, but, uh, <clears throat> there are certain things that I think each person kind of needs in their life, like stability of their of their profession and um friends and family and things like that and so um a lot of times bodybuilders work uh counterproductively they're like i'm in contest prep i'll see my friends in a few months you know i'm not going to talk to my family anymore um they remove all of the joy from their life <laughs> you know what I mean? And so it's like, no wonder you're struggling with sticking to your diet because food is a joy in life. You know what I mean? Like uh, we all love to eat. So it's like uh, you, okay, you're already removing one of your fundamental joys in life, which is eating. And then you're going to make it worse by not doing any activities that you enjoy or talking to people that you like talking to. And it's like, of course, that you're going to binge occasionally because you're your body and brain are searching for some form of joy in your, in your existence. <laughs> I also think there's something very dangerous about idle hands during a prep. So when you tell your family, your friends work, I quit work. I'm not coming in anymore. I got a prep. I'm a bodybuilder now. And then you just have nothing to do. And you're sitting in front of the computer and you're hungry as shit. And there's some hot cocoa Hershey's kisses staring at you. They're staring at me right now. They're looking at me. You have no power over me. And then but, you just go. Yeah. But I agree with what Paul's saying though, too, is like with, um, with, so like, but if you didn't have the stressors, you could just focus more on the things that you enjoy. Like, Very you true. know, like if you didn't have to do the work, you could, you know, talk to people, you could go see a movie or, you know what I mean? Like you could do the, it, it, I think it's the compounding, like, okay, what are the, um, what are the pleasant things in your life? And what are the unpleasant things in your life? I mean, it's like if you let these during prep, if you let the the pleasant things in your life diminish while these unpleasant things, because the unpleasant things become more unpleasant when you're tired and hungry. Right. So it's like these things are already going to start stacking up. Can you make sure that at least very least these don't drop? Um, and so I, I. Yeah, go ahead. So, uh, Paul, I, it was your client's fault. Blame your damn clients. No, <laughs> no, I definitely see your point, too, Ryan, because it. Being busy um, definitely made me so much less food focused, you know, um, but at the same time, like the the stress of like, OK, we wake up, we immediately we 
we get ready to go to the gym. We eat, we go to the gym, we bang out our cardio, we get a big portion of our steps done for the day, and then I'm going to work. And But now instead of writing a program in 30 minutes, because like mentally after all that activity and just being hungry and stuff, instead of writing a program in 30 minutes, it takes like an hour plus, and then you got like six of them to do that day, and then people are texting you in between, and uh, you're fading sharply as the day goes on, and girlfriend comes home from work and you're like, I still have a lot of work to do. You finish your work and then you're like, okay, it's uh 730 at night. I need to eat my last meal and go to bed immediately. Just <laughs> a- after months of that, you're just like, dude, just, just trying to hold it all together, you know? <laughs> for sure. For sure. No, I think I've been on both ends of the spectrum. I've been very not busy in preps and I've been very busy in preps. And I mean, I don't know if I would call one easy or easier than the other. They both have their their pros and cons. But um, one question, that, one more question that I did want to ask Cliff, because I think there is a misconception. Now, people look at Cliff's clientele. Cl- Cliff has a lot of very, very elite competitors. And people tend to believe that because these individuals are genetically elite, they have an easy time getting to stage. And Cliff's already smiling, kind of laughing because he realizes how silly that statement is. But what are some of the things that even your genetic elite clients have to do um, that, you know, Joe Schmo also has to do to get in shape? Um, You know, man, that is a great question because uh, oftentimes people don't, especially high level competitors, don't talk about their struggles publicly. Um. Which I think is good practice, to be honest with you. Um, I think it's best to confide in those struggles with a few select people, not the world. Um, but uh, <clears throat> it happens, and top competitors cheat on their diet too. Uh, and and in my experience, possibly even at a higher rate than I would say mid-level competitors. I'm not gonna, um, and I say this because they have the genetics to allow them to get away with it occasionally. And um, in the back of their mind, they know this. Um, And so, uh, you know, I think one of the the difficulties is that it's hard for everybody. And so it's like, I I think you always have to convince people with average genetics that if they do everything correctly, they can possibly win. And with elite genetics, you have to convince them that if they don't do everything correctly, they can possibly lose. Um, and so, um, I would say the struggles are, are equal. Um, a lot of times, uh, you're going to be looking at, um, a, a perfect example. I don't know if you guys have noticed the same. I think that people with extremely fast metabolic rates seem to struggle more with, um, hunger during their preps Definitely. because they've never had to develop the tools of dealing with hunger in their life. They've been able to free eat for their entire life. And so a contest prep comes along and hunger is like a new sensation for them. They've never had to develop those tools to do that. And so I would say along those lines with elite competitors, genetically elite in different ways, um, is sometimes it can be a rude awakening because in prep, you can't coast on genetics quite as much as you used to. And so if you haven't had to develop the tools to be able to do these things correctly, I mean, I remember coaching a guy one time who was one of the more genetic elite clients that I've ever coached. He was extremely muscular. He won, he won multiple natural shows, pro natural pro shows, big ones too. Uh, And his training intensity was outrageous. Like we'd go in the gym We'd go in the gym and he would uh, he would never squat over like 315 for like six reps. And if I had to take a guess, he was probably capable of like mid five. And I'd be like, why aren't you pushing? And he's like, I just like to get a good rhythm going. And um, <laughs> and I'd be like, and here I'm like, damn. It's like and something so, you expect um, out of like a tennis player. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, he was he was beating guys on stage that probably busted their ass but it caught up with him once he started going to the natural world championships like he never really cracked the top 10 because 
eventually you are going to run into people that have the similar genetic ability to you, but learn to develop those tools. And so, um, and, and overcome those struggles. So I think it's like, just because it hasn't bitten you in the ass yet, doesn't mean it won't. Um, and I think genetically, we all just have to work at the level that we've been given and try to maximize what we can do with it. Absolutely. Yeah. No, that's funny. <laughs> Getting in a rhythm. You said you did train <laughs> with him. If I was training with him and he had quads <laughs> twice the size of mine and he's getting in a rhythm on squats, I, I, I don't know. I might just I might have to just leave the gym. He, he was um, he was one of my, uh, you know, he was uh, local to me and he's a, he's a great guy. And But it was uh, it was funny, like my younger brother, my younger brother was probably 16 at the time, but he was pretty strong for a 16 year old. I think he deadlifted like 385 for a couple reps when he was 16. And um, the other guy, I mean, this is a champion level bodybuilder and he put on 315 and did like three or four reps. And then my brother goes and does like 385 for a few. And the guy goes, wow, you're really going for it. <laughs> and, my brother, and my brother goes, wait a minute, was that your first set? And he goes, yeah. And he goes, I, he goes my brother 16 years old talking to this guy who's won multiple bodybuilding shows. My brother goes, I wouldn't count that. I'd, I'd put that as a warm up. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, over the years, he did end up getting better at um, developing those techniques. But Honestly, it took him getting his ass kicked a few times to really like, you know, show him he needed to. So I think that um, for everybody, the struggles are always there. It's just different. I think um, oftentimes um, for average competitors, it's like, OK, things are hard. Um, I have to push through. Um, then I think for enhanced or not, enhanced, but, uh, gen you know, Elite competitors is the word I was looking for. Elite competitors, it becomes this, um, okay, things are hard. Do I need to push through? Do you know what I mean? And so it's like they have to find their own way to be able to get themselves to do what needs to be done. Yeah. So I think we're coming up on our time limit, but the people love to hear numbers. They love to hear the horror stories and the low numbers, the crazy prep numbers. So, Cliff, I'm going to throw this one at you. The lowest calories plus highest cardio that you've seen, and don't name any names because we don't want anyone to know who's who's doing this, who you're giving this out to, that you've seen from competitors. Well, we'll, we'll all like, round don't, table don't it. Don't make me do this. That I've oh, prescribed no, or that I've seen? That you've prescribed. Cliff, you used to do a really, really good series. I don't know if you can plan on continuing doing it. You used to post, like I remember you did it with Katie, uh, Katie Ann, and you did it with a couple of your male world competitors. You posted like what their calories and their cardio were. And I'm like, holy shit, I wish more coaches would do this to see what these numbers actually look like. I I, I need to do that again. It's been a couple of years since I've done that. Um, you know, I'll even say her name because I wrote an article about it. Uh, <laughs> uh, I worked with um, uh, a client named Carrie Bolin. And so Carrie's a first off, she's a bodybuilder, a natural bodybuilder. Um, she her stage weight was only 103 pounds because she was only five foot tall. Um, so she's more shredded than a bikini competitor. So like, you know, when body fat levels get even lower, the metabolic rate drops even more. Um, she was like close to 50 years old. So she was like menopausal. Um, she, you know, like I said, so she's a little bit on the older side. She's super lean. Um, she, you know, she's tiny. And um, I, the lowest we got to was like an hour of cardio per day. But we got down to like just under 900 calories per day for a few weeks there. And I mean, she spent most of her prep sub 1000. Um, and I felt super wrong to me. Like I was yeah. like, I cannot believe this. And honestly, she was getting emails from me. It wasn't even her check-in day. And I'm like over here worried. I'm like, how are you doing, Carrie? Are you feeling okay today? You know? Um, and you know, oh, and to add on top of it, she had, um, she had, uh, uh, a tear in, um, in her shoulder and she, she knew it was her last show till she retired. So she's like, I'm pushing through this. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that was the lowest I'd ever gone. Um, I wouldn't, and I'm going to put the disclaimer on that. 
Um, so she was going for the natural bodybuilding world championships at the time. One, she was a very experienced competitor and I knew that she had it in her mentally to tolerate it and not be broken by it. And she had the chance to win and she did end up winning it actually. Um, but I always say like, I'm not going to go to that level for a first time, you know, or a bikini competitor going to nationals for the first time. Like I'm not going to give someone eight, you know, 900 calories to have them get third call out instead of fourth at nationals. You know what I mean? Like, um, I think that there's a certain like building process that goes on and, you know, a risk reward type of, um, equation. And once again, I asked her, you know, I asked her like, are you up to this? Do you feel good about this? Are you comfortable? Things like that. I, I wanted to put two things in here real quick. One, I just wanted to see if you identify with this. Um, so I recently dieted a girl who is natural, who started her diet at 103 pounds. So like we first, I was like, Hey, let's dial in on maintenance. You know, we settled somewhere around 1400 calories. We start the diet. I'm already pulling like, uh, I think two, 300 calories. So we're already around like 1100 or so 12, 1100. And I remember every weekend when I, I would go in to check her update, I'm like, please don't let this be the weekend I have to pull food. And then when you see that you don't, you're like, thank God I didn't have to pull food this week. <laughs> like, <laughs> let's keep this going as we can. Do you, do you have those feelings? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, and it is bad too. And I, I, and I always just try like kind of ask how they're doing. And, you know, I use the biggest gauge of is how they're doing. Um, I, another thing that I always say is that um, the clients in general that usually struggle the most with like needing to get lower food and higher cardio are black female competitors. Um, I mean, you know, there's always exceptions, but I would say, Usually black competitors have to go a little bit lower than white competitors with caloric intakes. Um, and women have to go a little bit lower with caloric intakes than men. So then when you get a black, things usually need to be pushed to the extreme. And so, um, but the, the interesting thing is that um, they don't seem to have the same suffering levels. Like they don't feel as bad on these lower calories that oh. at least that I would expect. So like, I, I coached this one competitor one time and she won a couple of natural pro shows herself. And I mean, we were down to, you know, she, she was like in the one twenties, but we were down to like just under a thousand calories and she was doing like an hour of cardio a, a day, but she was like sending me videos where she was still setting like personal records on her lips. And I'm like, I don't even understand this. Oh, no, absolutely, man. And I actually, with that same person right now, um, we're pulling food back up and I have her at like 1380 and she keeps under eating. And I'm like, you're not hungry. What? How are you not hungry? Like eat your food. But, uh, no, something I wanted to circle around to you because you said with some competitors, there's a certain place that you may not push them. Like, you know, you, maybe you feel like they're just not ready for it. Um, so I'd imagine in some of those circumstances, you uh you sacrifice a bit of conditioning in those circumstances right here there with some clients and i I was sort of wondering because i feel like that's something a lot of coaches struggle with and i know i struggle with too is like going into something and just being too afraid to put somebody on stage that isn't there um you know one thing i'll say is that like one, if I think that they are capable of getting there, you know, mentally and physically, and I think we're coming up on a show and they're not quite ready for whatever reason, maybe they've cheated on their diet. Maybe I missed time something. I'm like, let's choose a later show. Um, so I try to really talk them in their show. Um, and, um, but if it's a matter of like, I try to stress to my, you know, and, and it's usually with someone that's like a first time competitor or a newer competitor, because I genuinely think that, um, how do I word this? But, um, I come off at times as being like a win at all costs coach. <laughs> um, but I'm more, um, I never sacrifice long-term 
reward for short term reward. Um, and so if I have a client where I don't think that and, and you know, I, I, I may be nitpicking here, but we may be talking the difference between like three pounds, you know, but those th last three pounds can be brutal sometimes. So um, if I have a client where I'm like, I don't think that they, you know, what's the what's the reward at this first show if I continue to pile on cardio or cut calories? Is the reward a possible win or are we looking at going from, you know, fifth, fifth place to fourth place? You know what I mean? So uh, I, I try to ask myself, what is the reward for pushing this person even harder? Um, what is the risk? And especially if it's a newer competitor, the risk is I push them too far mentally because also with an experienced competitor, you can ask them, how are you doing? And they know. Um, newer competitors, they don't really know exactly how they're doing. <laughs> you know, they, they think they can push through anything, but you guys know. Ha, ha, have you ever seen those instances where a first-time competitor got absolutely crushed by some coach and then they never want to compete again or they they can't get their they can't get their diet back on track because now they have like mental disorder issues with food and like um i view that as sacrificing short term uh they sacrificing the long term reward for the short term reward and so um sometimes i'll tell my clients is you know uh i'll say i'll just lay it out i'll say like um, I think you will be at your best when we can get a tiny bit leaner in future shows. Um, based on what I've seen, I don't think that this is the show. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think that this is, we come in here and we build upon this. Um, and, you know, and, and I'll even lay it out for them. You know, I, I, I'm probably too honest at times, but I'll lay it out for them, like things that I need to see get better. Um, and mentally and physically, like, you know, if, if we needed more time, I'll say next time we need a little bit more time or, um, I need to see, I'll even, you know, like you said, there are some times where people are laid out in their emails and they seem a little unsteady to me. Um, like they're up and they're down. And so, you know, I, I'm going to pull my punches. I'm not going to give them a ton of cardio when I'm seeing this unsteadiness. And I'll say, we can get you leaner after we've developed a more steady, steady, um, demeanor through the entire prep. So, um, uh, I'll tell them what we need to work on in order to be able to push that harder. Does that make sense? For sure. For sure. This is a weird endeavor. You know, I, I know I've mentioned this before on like previous podcasts, but like, uh, I feel like this is like one of the few competitive endeavors where the expectation that people have on themselves or maybe social media puts on people is like one of the only endeavors where as an amateur, the expectation is to have like an elite showing early on where like in every other athletic or competitive endeavor, like people just go through the ranks, they pay their dues and it takes time to reach that elite status. <laughs> Man, you are so right with that. Like how many times, I mean, I feel like every year or so there's a new person at my gym getting ready for their first show and they're like, yeah, I figure I'll, do this show and then try to go to nationals for my pro card. And I'm like, <laughs> like a middle like, school quarterback. Like, eh, I think I'm going to go to Atlanta Falcons training camp next week. Like, <laughs> uh, I start, I start working at like, somebody starts working at like Chase Bang. They're like, I'm probably going to be CEO in a few months. You better <laughs> get used to it. You know, I'm like, slow down. Like, why don't you do this one and see how it goes here? <laughs> If people have a previous athletic history, I think that you can kind of reel them in with that, though. It's like, all right, so your first game when you were on the varsity basketball team, <laughs> did you think that you were going to put up 30 points in a triple-double? And they're like, no, I was just happy that I got in and I, I grabbed two rebounds. It's like, okay, it's the same thing with bodybuilding. Like this first show, we're going to get in there, we're going to grab two rebounds. And that might, that might be really good. Those might be game-winning rebounds, and you might get a first in novice, a good placing in open, and we can build upon that. Yeah. Did so. I, I'm sorry. I know I'm trying to be respectful of your time, but this. Uh, but excuse things. him as he doesn't respect your time. <laughs> <laughs> but um, did it take you a while to sort of be confident and comfortable with yourself to to be like, OK, like it's OK, you know, that, you know, this person is going to go on stage and, you know, um, not be totally there and to sort of break that to clients and have them understand that as well, just on both ends, I guess. Um, I, I give myself a 
95% rule. Um, I'll let people get up on stage at 95% of their best. Um, uh, if they're not, if I don't feel they're 95% there, then I'm going to say, cause I feel like most people can get to 95% with, you know, with whatever tools they're working with. And I say 90, 95% of whatever is at that time um but uh you know there is a point where it's like you do have to find that balance between being like hey you know there are still a few more percentage points but you gotta i, I think um getting people in the in the mindset of that this is a building spot um focusing on if they got better from their last show i also saw 95 percent rule combined with not letting them get on stage worse than they've been in the past. Um, and honestly, that's kind of where my job description started off with is that like when I first started coaching people, because I wasn't formally educated, I didn't know if I should be doing it. I knew I knew what I was talking about, but I just didn't know if I should. And I kind of just took the approach of uh, I know I can get them better than what they've gotten for themselves. And if I was sure of that, then I would take the job. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so um, I, I would say with that and then, um, you know, I, I, with the confidence of just being okay with it, um, I would say just focus on, once again, whether or not you help them improve because that's what it's all about. This isn't a uh, game of perfection. It's a game of um, ever improving physiques and process and mindset. And it's like, um, if they improved, then I would say you did your job. Yeah, for sure. Cam, Paul, anything you wanted to circle back to as we suck her out? I think I've done enough circling back. <laughs> enough circling. He's dizzy. Cliff, anything you wanted to touch on again? No, I just, I really appreciate you guys having me on. Yeah, we really appreciate it, too. And I know that these guys are still full of some questions. So maybe we'll do it again in the future. Um, I'd love to talk about some different topics with you. But let us know what's in store for you uh, the rest of this year, the rest of this COVID filled year and any new projects in the work. We heard about the new book. Uh, Cliff's got a great old book, the complete contest prep. Yes. Textbook. Yeah. Uh, I, I wrote it with a, a client of mine, Pete, uh, Dr. Peter Fitchin. He's uh, you know, we, he and I, he's been kicking my ass this year on the coaching front. Occasionally it seems like he's been getting a, uh, getting a pro card at like every show he's been sending clients to becomes master. I know. Uh, so we, um, yeah, we, we, we wrote a book together and we kind of just, our goal was, um, we realized that not everybody can afford a good coach, um, or any coach or like, you know, most people can afford a $30 book. And so we, we wanted it to be something that if you had never prepped before, you could pick it up and read it front to cover and prep yourself with it. So we did that. And then the new book, um, I am finishing up the last chapter before I submit it to editing finally. Um, and it's, uh, hopefully people will bear with me. It is, I don't mention bodybuilding in it once. <laughs> um, I don't, it's, it is purely, it is applicable to bodybuilding. Um, but it's, if I mentioned, if I equated everything in it with bodybuilding, the book would be way too long. And so, um, I, I am very clear in like essentially like how to build yourself up. Um, and it can be used for bodybuilding or whatever purposes you want to use it for. So, um, it ended up being quite a bit longer than I anticipated. So, uh, you know, finally, after a couple of years of writing, it's, it's finally just about done. When can the people get their hands on it? Um, I'm trying to get it out by February. Okay. Um, uh, it'll probably be February. Cause like I said, I'm almost done, but, uh, I know how long the editing process takes. So, um, you know, I, I think February, March, maybe even, um, right. hopefully. Uh, I was hoping to get it out while people were stuck inside with COVID, but that didn't seem to, <laughs> to work out. But it might be coming back. It might be coming that. back. I still be in there. So <laughs> yeah. So where can people find more about you? Facebook, Instagram, your website, all that. Um, probably Instagram and my website. So Instagram is uh, at CW Team Wilson, and uh, my website is TeamWilsonBB.com. Awesome. All right, guys, thanks for coming out. Thanks for listening. We'll see you on the next one. And as always, you know what to do. Stay gifted. See ya.